Lucian was one of the great comic satirists of antiquity, and he influenced an array of subsequent writers. However, few details about the man himself are certain. Apart from a disputed passage in the Greek physician Galen, Lucian is not mentioned by any contemporary writers. Historians are left to reconstruct his life from various references internal to his works. Lucian's setting was the 2nd century AD. He was born around 120 AD in Samosata, a town on the Euphrates in the Roman province of Syria. This period, typically termed the Second Sophistic, was constituted by writers seeking to embody the ancient traditions of Attic Greek literature from its golden age, the 5th and 4th centuries BC, the era of figures like Plato and philosophy, Herodotus and Thucydides in history, Demosthenes and oratory, Euripides, Sophocles, and Aeschylus in tragedy, and Aristophanes in comedy. Many works survive from the Second Sophistic, and from Lucian we have received a substantial collection of nearly 80 works. He stands out in his embodiment of the literary stylings of Attic prose through the practice of mimesis, the creative imitation of a literary model. This practice was fundamental to the education system during the Second Sophistic, and the Sophists emerged from this system as influential professional speakers, working in the courts and traveling around giving speeches on a variety of historical and fictional themes. Some served as teachers, secretaries, and ambassadors. So, the Sophists were a prestigious intellectual force in the second century. Lucian never says whether he formally took up a career as a Sophist, though he likely spent time as a traveling lecturer in Asia Minor, Athens, and Gaul. At about 40, he turned to literature. Later in life, he worked as an advisor under a prefect in Egypt. Lucian died sometime after 180. Lucian produced many works in traditional categories, so-called practice speeches about a historical or fictitious topic, display speeches of a range of oratorical types, including praise and blame, introductory speeches, a typically brief speech preceding a public performance. In his work, The Dream, Lucian provides a purportedly autobiographical account of how he chose his career. When he has a dream in which two women representing sculpture and culture vie for his commitment. As a child, he became an apprentice under his uncle, who was a highly regarded sculptor. My uncle handed me a chisel and told me to give a light tap to a stone tablet lying before us, quoting the proverb, well begun is half done, but being inexperienced, I hit it too hard, the tablet broke, and in a rage, he grabbed a nearby stick and gave me an initiation which was neither gentle nor encouraging. Thus, my apprenticeship began with tears. So I ran away and went home, sobbing continuously, and my eyes full of tears. I told them about the stick and showed them my bruises, and I accused my uncle of great brutality, adding that he had done it through envy that I might excel him in his own craft. My mother consoled me and strongly abused her brother, but that night I fell asleep still crying and thinking of the stick. In my sleep came a dream from the gods through the night divine, so vivid that it seemed completely real. Two women held me by my hands, and each was trying with violent force to drag me to herself. One was masculine in appearance, like a workman, with dirty hair, calloused hands, and clothes tucked up, and covered with marble dust, just like my uncle when he was cutting stone. The other had a lovely face, a fine figure, and a neatly worn cloak. At length, they let me decide which of them I wanted to live with. I went joyfully over to culture, especially with the thought of that stick in my head, and the many blows it had dealt me as soon as I started working the day before. Culture looked at me and said, I shall accordingly repay you for making this wise and just decision. Come now, get up on this chariot, showing me one drawn by winged horses like Pegasus, so you can learn how much you would have missed if you had not joined me. I got up and she took the reins and drove off, and I was carried high up, so that, traveling from east to west, I viewed cities, races, and peoples. The people looking up from below applauded me, and everyone I passed over in my flight sent me on my way with blessings. 
Having shown all this to me, and me to my well-wishers, she brought me back, no longer wearing the same clothes as when I started my flight. I seemed to have come back in fine purple dress. She found my father standing and waiting for me, and showed him these clothes and the figure I presented on my return, and she also reminded him of the plans they had come close to making for me. Lucian's role in the development of satiric literature lies in his work on the comic dialogue. Lucian took the dialogue, used famously by Plato, and transformed the typically serious form into a means of communicating humor. Many of his pieces are comic dialogues, and others include elements of dialogue as part of their structure. Sometimes Lucian provides a narrative, as in A True History, his most famous work. In other cases, a narrative is presented within a letter, as in The Passing of Peregrinus and Alexander the False Prophet. While Lucian's minor dialogues, the dialogues of the dead, of the gods, of the sea gods, and of the courtesans, are mythological in nature, many of Lucian's speakers are assumed to be real people. Lucian's philosophical commitments are not entirely clear. He critiques the Stoics, is somewhat less abrasive toward the Platonists and the Pythagoreans, is variously friendly or critical toward the Cynics, and is perhaps most agreeable regarding the Epicureans. His general aim is the sharing of a comedic perspective on the laughable behavior of others. Later writers shaped by Lucian include Renaissance humanists Erasmus and Thomas More, who together translated selections of his works into Latin. Erasmus's Praise of Folly and More's Utopia were two of the essential works of the period and each displayed Lucian's influence. More's Utopia combines the Lucianic motifs of satirical dialogue and imaginary journey. The latter theme was subsequently taken up by Jonathan Swift in Gulliver's Travels. We've had a glimpse of how Lucian was seen through the ages, but how did our satirist view himself? Lucian concludes the dream with a bit of introspection. I have told you about this dream in order that the young may take the better course and embrace culture, especially if poverty should make any of them play the coward and ruin a noble nature by inclining towards the worst path. I am sure that any such will be strengthened by hearing my story and taking me as a fitting example for himself. He will realize both what I was when I eagerly went after all that is noblest and set my heart on culture, not flinching before the poverty I then suffered, and what I am now I have come back to you, if nothing else, at least as highly esteemed as any sculptor around. Thank you for watching. Next time, I'll introduce Lucian's contribution to historiography with his work, How to Write History, 